just throw your hands up to heaven right now because he is our very help. But he's also our healer. Hallelujah.
Now it's time for the life-changing Word of God. This week, Bishop Keith challenges us to adopt a new way of thinking. The only way this is possible is if we develop a renewed mind. A renewed mind comes from the absorption of God's Word. God's Word has the ability to displace bad thinking from our minds and replace it with good, wholesome principles that can assure us of productive living. The Bible says how we think is who we are. If that's true, and it is, then we have to be concerned with what we spend our time thinking about. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7, as Bishop Keith shares today's message entitled, A Renewed Mind. Amen. Let's pray for our youth as they um, go into their class. Father, thank you so much for all these young people. We thank you for their lives, for their purposes, for their destinies, God. Uh, as they go into their classes and uh, get the word of God, let it find good ground in their hearts, God, that they are the church of today, that they will go to their schools and wherever they play or wherever they go, God, that they'll be examples of Christ's likeness. So God, in the name of Jesus, let everything that is done and said in those classes be done decently and in order. Bless the teachers. Give them revelation and understanding of what to preach and what to teach. We give your name praise. It is so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's God bless our youth. Amen. Amen. If you are here and maybe even for the first time, if we have some in, that are in junior or senior high, uh, you can just get up and follow them. They'll tell you where to go. Once you get out in the lobby, they'll point you in the right direction. Uh, last thing that I want to say before we uh, preach the word today, um, we didn't really announce it, so, so to speak, today, but we have the Walk a Mile in My Shoes that is coming up uh, in about two weeks, February the 14th, and we always participate in that. We're kind of in covenant, really, with uh, the Muncie Mission, who's a sponsor of the walk. Uh, they, the Attic Window North on Broadway uh, is a building that they are leasing from us. We own that building, and so we're kind of in covenant with them. And so what we're going to do today, um, we, we want to encourage you to get in your small groups or get with a group uh, to actually walk on that day. We're going to meet at 8 o'clock in the morning. And so we want to encourage you to be uh, involved in that, but today we're going to have some ushers stationed in the back. Listen, we're not going to twist your arm. We're not going to tell you what to give, none of that, um, but we would like to encourage you if you would like to do that. Maybe you can't uh, participate in the walk. Maybe you're not going to be available, whatever it is, um, but we would love to, to give them a big offering. So the next two weeks, listen now, let, in the next two weeks we'll have some ushers stationed back. They'll just have the baskets Nobody's going to tell you what to give. You just give that. You don't feel need to feel any compulsion at all. But if you uh, send something in your spirit and you want to do something, you also want to be nice. It's a great organization. In the last 11, 12 years that they've had this walk, they've raised over a half a million dollars. <laughs> Amen. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. They're a great organization, very well run. And so uh, we want to be a blessing to them. And so please be reminded of that. I won't mention it anymore today, but uh, when you see them back there, Amen. Don't just tap. You know, we were taught back in the day to just tap the offering plate. That doesn't help us. <laughs> Hallelujah. You got to put something in there. <laughs> Amen. So if you feel so led, please do that. Amen. All right. Listen, founded in 1944, the familiar slogan for the United Negro College Fund is this. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. As I was preparing for this message, I was meditating on what it might mean to waste a mind. One definition, definition for waste is this, to use or expend carelessly, extravagantly, or to no purpose. These words of explanation infer the existence of the great potential the mind contains. To waste it denotes the squandering of that potential, opting for careless and purposeless thoughts that have little or no redemptive value. The word of God declares that you are as you think. 
So it is prudent to get your mind under the control of the Holy Spirit so as not to waste it according to God's perspective. We do this by a process called renewal. Everybody say renewal. Biblically, it is replacing our current mindsets with the thoughts encouraged and transformed by the word of God. With that being said, my message today is simply a renewed mind. Amen. Can we say that together? A renewed mind. A renewed mind. There was a man, a man who had worked all of his life, had saved all his money, and was a real miser when it came to his money. Just before he died, he said to his wife, when I die, I want you to take all my money and put it in the casket with me. I want to take my money to the afterlife with me. So he got his wife to promise him with all her heart that when he died, she would put all the money in the casket with him. <laughs> well, as you can probably imagine, he died. He was stretched out in the casket and his wife was sitting there in black and her friend was sitting next to her. And when they finished the ceremony and the, the funeral, just before the undertakers got ready to close the casket, the wife said, wait, 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 just wait, wait a minute. Hold on. She had a box with her, one big box. And she came over the box uh, with the back box and put it in the casket. Then the undertakers locked the casket down and they rolled it on out. So her friend said, I, I know you weren't foolish enough to put all that money in there with your husband. And the loyal wife replied, listen, I'm a Christian. I can't go back on my word. I promised him that I was going to put all of that money in the casket with him. And that's exactly what I did. The friend said, you mean to tell me you put that money in the casket with him? I sure did, said the wife. I got it all together, put it into my account, and wrote him a check. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Listen, without God, we humans are pretty messed up. In fact, even with godly influence, we all have our struggles. Let me see the hands of those of you who have some struggles. And those of you who don't have your hands up, we're going to have an altar call later. <laughs> and we got plenty of oil to pour on your head for lying. Listen, the Apostle Paul gives us some great revelation dealing with the mind. He also tells us how we should deal with it. In order to be successful. In Romans chapter 7. That's where we're going to launch from. Uh, Paul explains our dilemma. Here it is now. We're going to read in the New Living Translation. It'll be on the screen. Romans chapter 7 starting at verse 14. It reads like this. So the trouble is not with the law. For it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. For I am all too human a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, or I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing it. And, and, and it, it is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle. This is Paul speaking. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Come on here now. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, 
But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So far, the scripture. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day that you've made. What a privilege that we have to share the word of God. We break up the fallow ground of our own hearts that we might receive the engrafted word of God that is able to save our souls. None of me and all of you. Let glory manifest in this room. We give your name the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I like Joyce Meyer quote, uh, a quote that she has all the time. Here, here's what it is. Where the mind goes... The man follows. She says it all the time. Where the mind goes, the man follows. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You've heard that before. That just means that your mind controls the direction that you're going. What you're thinking on your mind determines the direction in life that you're going. Lots of people are struggling with all kinds of issues. Come on now. We've already acknowledged that. But struggle really can be a good thing. Listen now. Because you only struggle with something that you oppose. I'll say it again. A, a, a struggle for Christianity and for us as we as Christians uh, can be a good thing because um, when you're struggling, that means you're fighting some inclinations that you really don't want to do so that you oppose it. Uh, I'm going to give you a clue. Most sinners, most people who are not serving God, most people who are not living by the word, listen, they don't have a struggle with their sin. Are you still here? Uh, they, they don't struggle at all because at that point in, our, in their lives, they don't really want to change. And such were some of us. Are you still here? All of us have had our days where we didn't really uh, serve God and we weren't thinking about God. And, and on our minds, we're just big enough to do whatever we want to do. And you know, the, the insidious thing about it is you can do wrong and not even have any conviction. Just do your thing. But when there is opposition, when there is a struggle, when you, you know to do good and you, you know that you really want to do right, but yet there's something pulling on you, that can be a good thing in the sense that you at least have and acknowledge the word of God and the law of God and have a desire to perform it, but you've got this struggle going on because the law of sin on the inside is pulling at you. I mean, I want to give some revelation today about having a renewed mind and how it is that we can get some help. Paul helps us if we would be willing to listen and obey what the Apostle Paul says. Let's look at verses 21 through 23 one more time. I have discovered this principle of life. This is the Apostle Paul, the great man of God, arguably one of the, the greatest men that have walked the earth besides Jesus as a Christian. Here is what he's saying. I have discovered this principle that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. So far, the scripture. So, so Paul is saying there's something going on on the inside. I really want to do right. I really want to obey God. I really know what he's telling me to do, but there's something going on. It's called the flesh. Now, let me, let me give you a clue. Your biggest problem today is not the devil. So those of you who are old enough to understand this, listen, don't, don't listen to Flip Wilson. Because the devil did not make you do it. He might suggest it. He might get in covenant with your flesh. But most of your problems is your carnal nature, your flesh. When we talk about the flesh, really it's synonymous with having a carnal mind. We talked about this a little bit before. Uh, carnality, carn, it comes from carnivorous. That means a flesh eater. You know, when we talk about a lion or something like that being carniv carnivorous, it's your fleshly mind. It's this, it's this stuff we got to deal with. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 5, it, it lets us know, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, big S, that's Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit. 
For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, your problem is in your mind. And so today I, I want to preach by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would allow God to transform your mind into the mind of Christ. We, we need a new mind. We need a, a renewed mind. We need a different way of thinking. That's what he says when he talks about renewing our mind. Listen now, you are not tempted by things you don't desire. Let me talk to you just for a minute. Things that you are not studying. That's my word. Don't tempt you. Listen, I, I, I've never been tempted to smoke. You know, when we were coming up, smoking was a sin. I'm not so sure it is. No more than eating too much. <laughs> no more than talking about folks at lunchtime. Are you still here? Now, nah, smoking is bad for you. I'm, I'm, I'm just being facetious a little bit. But I've never had a problem with that. Never had a desire to smoke. And so somebody could offer me a cigarette, feel nothing. You know, when I was uh, a little younger, before I got saved, I got saved at 22, so I had a little window in there where it was okay for me to drink alcohol. <laughs> and so I was trying to impress my buddies and be kind of uh, a part of the group. You know, I had like, a, there were five of us that were really, really tight. And so I was trying to, to kind of fit in. Um, and so my, my drink of choice at that time uh, was a Tom Collins. How many know what that is? How, how you know what it is? And such were some of you. The wine olds. No, I'm saying. No, see, um, but you know, even when I was trying to do that and trying to fit in, it's still nasty. I know, I know what you're thinking. No, it ain't. Yes, it is. <laughs> A good old glass of Kool-Aid is better than the best Tom Collins I ever had. <laughs> but you know, I was trying to fit in trying to be a part of the club, trying to be a part of the group. And then, you know, uh, everybody, you know, I, I was a little bit of an athlete back in the day, and I wasn't the greatest, but I, I, I liked to win. I liked to compete and all that. And so, you know, you get hot and sweaty playing a little ball, a little tennis, whatever I was doing. And so, you know, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to be like everybody else. I, you know, they all just start talking about this. Uh, let me get me a cold beer. That's the nastiest thing they ever have created in life. Beer is nasty. I, I, I know what you're thinking. I don't, I don't hurt at all. No, Pastor, when it's really cold, <laughs> it's still nasty. I hate I even, so anyway, I went there, and um, so when I got saved, that wasn't, that, that wasn't a temptation for me because it's nasty anyway. I don't want none. I don't want to smoke. I think I've been high a couple of times. I'm just telling you all my business, ain't I? It's like, Pastor, you was a, you, you smoked at Mary Joanna? <laughs> y'all ain't gonna tell, oh, I'm, I'm all on the internet. I, not not really, that wasn't me. Yeah, I tried a few little things. I, I was too much of a chicken to try anything hard, so I never did coke or nothing crazy. But I, you know, I thought I was cool, I tried to be cool. Hey, Amen. somebody in this room could tell on me, but. You know, I'll hurt him later. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, here's the thing. Once I got saved, that stuff wasn't appealing to me. The Bible says that God cannot be tempted with evil and that neither does he tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. In other words, the devil's not going to mess with you with something that you, he knows you don't care anything about. He's going to entice you with something that this flesh really has a desire for. Amen. So this flesh that we have to deal with, if we don't renew our minds, it will tempt us and it will try to draw us away from the things of God. 
Come on, I'm preaching already. Somebody needs to understand that. It's the problem in your head. It's between your ears. So if we renew our minds, we will overcome temptation. Here's the answer. Romans chapter 12, you know it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I, I love that because Paul says, listen, it is your reasonable service. In other words, you ain't doing God no big favor. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice, sacrificing to live holy, doing whatever it is you can to please God. It's your reasonable service. I love the NIV uh, here, what it says. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Listen, he says, this is your true and proper worship. <laughs> that is great. So it's not just lifting your hands. It's not just singing the songs that we sing. Uh, part of this is your, your living sacrifice. Part of it is God, take all of me. He says in verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of, pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Listen, mind renewal is only possible through the word of God. So if you're not in the word, your mind's not going to be renewed. You're going to submit to the thoughts and the edicts of our age, of our world systems. And our world systems, listen now, are going to hell. And so we cannot succumb to the thought patterns of what the world is saying and what the pundits are saying and what those that are being interviewed on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and all these opinions out there. Listen, you better found your life on the word. The word is the only thing that can tell us, listen now, what to think and that can transform us. God is so bodacious. He's so bad. He does not trust you to know even what to think. God tells you what to think. <laughs> Why is that? It's because, listen now, you can't trust what you think. Your thinking has got you in trouble. Say amen, somebody. Amen. You know I, I'm in the house. You, how you think has gotten you in trouble. You talked yourself in to going over that house and you knew you had no business over there. I don't even need a word of knowledge to preach that. Come on now. It's how we think. It's, it's where the man thinks, where the mind starts, where the mind ponders, the man follows. So we got to do something about this mind. Listen now, Proverbs 14, 12. You can't trust what you think. He says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. In, in other words, you can think you are right and be wrong. Now, I, I'm, I, I'm a, a person who likes to be right. And I, uh, I adopted this, this thought to help me with that. That says, I believe I'm right, but I could be wrong. And that just, that just helps me to think that sometimes we can assume that we have all the information and we base a, we base a decision on that and we find out later that we were wrong. Anybody ever had that happen? You just could stand on it. You know, we have another little saying that we've got from Michael Pitts. It, it, it says that when you don't know what you don't know, you become aggressively ignorant. In other words, when you don't know you're wrong, you stand on principles, stand on thoughts, 
and you think you're right, you argue your point, and you are just straight up off. So God doesn't leave that to chance. He tells us what to think. Come on now. God word, God's word tells us what to think in all kinds of areas. I'm just going to deal with three of them, and then we're going to be done. Here's the first one. God's word tells us what to think about getting to heaven. And you know, that's kind of popular because we got a lot of spiritual folks now. They might not be Christians, but they're spiritual. And so if you listen to Oprah Winfrey and the people she hangs out with, a lot, a lot of them, they have a lot of good ideas. Some of them are demonic, but some of them are all right. <laughs> Y'all going to get me in trouble with Oprah. Hey Amen. Oprah is all right. She does a whole lot of good for the, for, the, for the natural. But she's leading a lot of folks astray. Because uh, being spiritual is not enough. You can be a devil worshiper and be spiritual. Are you still here? It's not just about being spiritual. It's about being uh, godly. And so when we think about how to get to heaven, the first thing we got to make a decision about is that God is right and we're wrong. The Bible is right and we are wrong. So we have to get in, in, in covenant with the Bible. Here's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That sounds like no other option. That means that if you are worshiping Allah, you ain't going. Oh, yeah, Pastor. There are many ways to get to heaven. No, it's not. The devil is a lie. Jesus declared about himself that I am the only way. If you want to go to heaven, we, you cannot get there without Jesus. Can I get a witness, somebody? Sorry. And see, as a pastor, as a new covenant, uh, last day preacher in 2015, I got to talk to myself before I get here and understand that our world is going to hell and they're trying to put pressure on us and they're trying to make us ecumenical in all kinds of ways. Well, you can, you can worship the God that you feel. The devil is a lie. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You're not going to get there without Jesus. Not going to happen. And so the pressure, come on now, the pressure to be politically correct. I just want to throw up every time I hear that. Gets on my nerves. Now, you know, I'm a pretty cool person. But that gets on my nerves. You can talk about everything else but Jesus. Got all these crazy ideas going on, but if we quote the Bible, all of a sudden, you're violating somebody's rights. Not violating your right. I got to listen to your foolishness. You listen to the word of God. How about that? Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me now. This, this foolishness. And so uh, I, I got to tell you the truth because there's all these voices out there. And the reason why we want other options is because Jesus is pretty direct. If you love me, keep my word. Well, I don't know about all that, Pastor. Okay, you, you, listen, we love everybody here. I believe in America the, the most beautiful thing about living in this nation, one of them, is that you can do whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do. You can believe in whatever God you want to believe in. You can worship a goat if you want to. No matter. But don't try to make that what the Bible says. Because the, the Bible is very clear. He goes on. Acts chapter 4. Here's what he says. Let it be known to you all, we are all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
Say amen, somebody. The name of Jesus is the only name. So if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to get Jesus in your life some kind of way. And I say that to you with love and grace and mercy. Because when you stand before him and you start talking about Muhammad and you start mentioning Buddha, I, I, I don't know what it's going to be like, but I can use my sanctified imagination that the God that's on the throne will say, you know, Paul, I know, Jesus, I know, but I don't know nothing about no Buddha. Muhammad died and never did get up, but my son got up. Yeah. Number two, God's word tells us what to think, listen now, about marriage. If you want to know about marriage, go to the word. Mark chapter 10, verse 4, they said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, here's Jesus, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In other words, God said a man and a woman come together. I'm just talking about the God of the Bible. You can, in our nation, unfortunately, you can marry who you want to now. You can marry whoever you want to. But God's not going to honor it. He's already declared what the definition of marriage is. And let me give you a clue. Hold, hold, hold on just one second. Just one God ain't changing his mind. You see, this message is all about a renewed mind because what we have to do as Christians, as believers, or even as seekers, we have to determine that God is right and I'm wrong. I don't care how I feel. See, that's where we messed up. We made our feelings the, the, the barometer for what we're able to do and not do. Listen, I might feel I want your wife. What if I decide I want Jessica? You get on out the way, Nate. <laughs> he, he punched his feet. Y'all couldn't see anything like that. <laughs> now I will fire no, no, no. <laughs> see how we laugh how absurd is that what I feel has nothing now I don't feel nothing towards wife don't be you know what I went to church today and the pastor said he wanted to assist the pastor's wife <laughs> Jesus let me clarify that look I'm, that was an example I already got a wife hallelujah Jesus. And I just tell you, I can't handle but one. <laughs> Woo! Glory. Glory, glory. Listen now. It's absurd. How you feel has nothing to do with what God said. God, he, he sets the standard and then our feelings have to come in line with the word. So if you've got some issues with marriage, if you've got a, some issues with who you're attracted to, you've got to say to God, listen, I am wrong and you are right. I know I feel this. This is real. I understand it's real, but i got to agree with God. Hallelujah. God's word tells us what to think about holiness in lifestyle. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 15. We're going to read two verses. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, 
A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So far the scripture. What is he saying? He's saying here, this, this is Paul giving admonition to his son Timothy. He's saying, listen, if you're going to claim Jesus, act like it. If you're going to say you're Holy Ghost filled, then act like you got some sense. Doesn't mean we're going to always be perfect. Nobody's perfect. We understand we sin from time to time, but it shouldn't be your lifestyle. There should be some restraint associated with your life. That's, that's the book. I didn't make it up. That's the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He's saying, listen, if you are claiming Jesus Christ, then you ought to leave iniquity alone. Well, what's that? Sin. Habitual sin. Letting your flesh run amok. Doing whatever you're big enough to do in spite of what the word says. He said, leave that alone. Don't let it be named amongst you. Listen, 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 13. Therefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be bought, brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen now. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. This means before you got saved. But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now, I know there's lots of controversy that goes along with this because when we say holiness, it, it conjures up all kinds of ideas and all that. We're not talking about any denominations. We're not talking about any heritage like that. We're just saying holy means holy. It means set apart. It means godly. It means living according to the word. It means if God said don't do it, don't do it. If God says you can do it, just do it until you're satisfied. It just means that whatever God says, that's it. End of discussion. That's really what holiness really is all about. It's being willing to submit to the word of God. Are you still here? And so holiness and lifestyle is not some nebulous old school you know, we say that kind of stuff. Somebody say, well, you know, you ought to stop sinning. Yeah, he really old school. Old school? The Bible is still right. It had not gone out of style. Living right is this new school. And we need some more new school. Woo, we got so much knowledge. We have so much uh, uh, know-how. We got all this technological advances, all these things going on in the mind, and it's warped our brain. Come on here. We need a renewed mind. God wants us to, what would it say? Be sober. Sobriety means that you're not under the influence of something. You're of sound. So Paul talked about this inward struggle. And I believe Jesus understands. The Bible says that we don't have a high priest, talking about Jesus, that cannot be touched, listen now, with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, the things that are pulling at us. He's not somebody that doesn't understand. But... He was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. In other words, he's, he's saying, I understand it's a struggle. I understand this flesh. I understand you got stuff pulling on you. I, I understand that even though you're looking at me right now and you're acting real spiritual, that you some of you got some stuff on your mind right now. I've been where you're sitting. I understand how it works, but he understands that. So he gives us the remedy, and the remedy is a renewed mind, a new way to think. If you renew your mind, it'll change your behavior. Listen now, here's the last thing. The only way 
to successfully walk with God is with a renewed mind. Listen, we can't trust ourselves because there's a way that seems right to us. It seems logical and natural. I mean, you know, go with me just a little bit. Give me a little grace here. It seems logical that you ought to be able to just do whatever you want. You're a free moral agent. <laughs> you have the ability to choose. Sounds logical that you ought to, you know, here's what's been said. You ought to be able to love who you want to love. Amen. Sounds reasonable. <laughs> but God's word says that I got to put some limitations on that. And God's word comes not to restrict, to, but to bless. It's in your best interest not to be a thief. It's in your best interest not to covet your neighbor's stuff. Not to be jealous and envious of other people. So when God tells us to renew our mind, he's doing that so that we can live a better life. Are you still here? And so today, this message comes to challenge you to stop making excuses. Stop, stop saying, well, this is just me. I'm so sick of hearing that. Just how I am. Well, then change because you're acting stupid. Are y'all still here? Can y'all handle this kind of preaching? I'm almost done. I'm going to let you out in just a few minutes. <laughs> the Bible says that we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear son, who's Jesus. In other words, God is going to deal with you about your stuff. That's why it's a struggle. And it's all good because he said, I'm able to do exceeding, abundantly, Above all that you can ask or think. And I know what you're thinking. Where did I get this mind from? Uh, uh, that's what Paul was saying. I want to do good, but this thing is pulling on me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from the bondage of this death. Thanks be to God. It's Jesus the Christ. That's the answer. And if you're in this room and you know you're struggling, you know you're struggling. You know how I know it? Because I'm struggling. Not struggling in the sense of, oh, I wonder if I'm going to stay saved or not. I wonder if I want to serve God or go back to the world. That, I, that's no struggle. I, I don't struggle with that. I'm saying this flesh never dies in this life. Came off a 21-day fast and thought I was kind of deep. And my flesh said, hey, I'm still here. You killed me yesterday, but I resurrected today. Here I am again. <laughs> you know what? Y'all know what I'm talking about. As soon as you come off the fast, you want to eat a whole cow. <laughs> Jesus. Listen now. These appetites come from the flesh. It's the same flesh that makes you want somebody that you ain't got no business with. That, that, that makes you want to tell a lie. Say it's the same flesh. So he gives us the answer. We got to renew our mind. Well, Pastor, I've always been that way. That's okay. Some of us have been this way a long time, but God has come to renew your mind and to flip that thing. Flip the script. So let's stand on our feet. I want our altar workers to come. I'm going to pray for everybody. We're going to sing here in a second. But I just want 
our altars are to be open because I, I, I'm feeling in my spirit that there are some of you that really need to come to the altar. You need to make a step. And you need to tell yourself and you need to tell the devil, I'm not going to stay like this. I'm tired of going around that mountain over and over and over. I'm tired of repenting of the same old dumb stuff. I'm telling you, today is your day of deliverance. It's having a renewed mind. And I believe God is going to deliver you today. If you're willing to take the step, and it's going to be up to you. I, I understand how it works because how our mind works, it determines what we do. And so uh, I, I know the temptation is, Oh man, I've always thought like I, 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 I can't I can't think any different. Listen, the Bible tells us to cast down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity. Listen now, not some thoughts, every thought unto the obedience of Christ. That just simply means I agree with God. If I got a crazy thought, I got to submit it to the word and bring the thought captive to the word of God. So our altars are open. We're going to sing and then I'm going to pray for everybody. We're going to have an opportunity in just a minute for you to join our church. I know that there's someone that mentioned that today. But I, I just want, I, I don't want to miss this moment. You know, there's something pushing me here. Because I, I, I understand how it is. As a pastor, I have seasons where the enemy is coming after me. And I, I know it. I, I know it when it starts. You know, every, every season is not the same. And I know, I know some of you think, well, only women have cycles. I didn't, I didn't say only women are psycho. <laughs> I said... No, no. There are seasons in our lives that we're more vulnerable to different things. I have to recognize that as a pastor. And when I've given out and preached and sweated and given out of my spirit, I'm more vulnerable at that time. So I got to be careful what I do. That's why I got to watch. Well, I got people around here that are, that are around me. I got to just ward off spirits, ward off stuff. Pastor, you mean you tempted too? Yep, tempted. Yep. Because this thing never dies. So we got to deal with it. But some of you have told yourself, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can change. Seems like I've been going around. Listen, today is your day. This message has come to remind you that all we need is a new mindset. And then what happens is you make a decision and then the power of the Holy Spirit comes in and orchestrates and facilitates the transformation. So we're going to be open. Come down. You don't have to have somebody pray. You can just come and kneel at this altar if you just want to get it together with him. But I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is here. And he's here to bless you, to change your mind, to renew your mind, to bring you back into the place that you know you ought to be. And we're going to sing. Real simple. All we want. This is a prayer to him. And all we need is found in Jesus. And all we ask is more of you. Oh, yes. Nothing else satisfies our heart's desire. Oh, want is more of you. Come on, you can come. Here it is. <laughs> For the Lord is. And his love endures. Yes, the Lord is good forever. You know what? And I'll shout it out from 
the mountain. The mountain yes, the Lord. Let's go! 